Okay, so here's what I would like you to write, okay? A quick first reaction to this, okay? On your sheet of paper, you're gonna write three things there, okay? Write three things that you think have revolutionized our life, starting from the wheel okay. <laughs> to where we are now. Just three things that you feel just change the way we live. Okay. You can compare with somebody next to you and see if you have any commonalities uh, between yourself and uh, your partner. Okay. Things that have revolutionized your life. <laughs> so, uh, anybody want to call out some that you have? Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Indoor plumbing. Okay, great. Okay. Uh, somebody in the middle. Go ahead. Okay, getting random shots. Cars. The paparazzi. Medicine? Okay. Electricity. Electricity. Internet. The internet. Back row. Refrigerate. Anybody? Refrigeration. Refrigeration. Electricity. Electricity. Cooked food. Cooked food. Yeah. As in Rosemary. Okay, yes, very interesting. Now, great, these all have revolutionized this. Ask the same question in your class. None of those answers will overlap with what we just now said here. Okay? I guarantee you, Facebook is on that list, right? Okay, that's definitely there. Cell phones are on that list. Okay, that's definitely there. YouTube is probably on that list. Okay, it's definitely there. Ask the same question, and it's a fascinating okay, exercise to see what our students are thinking has changed our life and what ours uh, and what we think. The reason is that they are taking so many things for granted. Okay, even to this day, I get goosebumps as I'm driving on my GPSS to the left. I said, whoa, okay, that used to be my wife who used to say that. <laughs> now, I got somebody who is able to, not only that, the thing is right. Okay, and that's the thing that I'm just fascinating. Also. Not that she wasn't right, okay, she was. Okay, hey, I gotta delete that part. <laughs> Let's delete that part over there, okay? Everything that's being said is being recorded, so I gotta be careful here. Okay. But they take these things for granted, and I, I just wonder to myself that if this is what we are now taking for granted, what's going to be there like 10, 15 years from now? Okay, what is going to be in that future? And it's just unbelievable. Okay, so what's there? We have no idea what's going to be there. Why? Because we had no idea we would be where we are. When you look back at all of these things here, it's, with reference to technology, you could say that there have been three revolutions that have taken place and we're in the midst of the fourth. Okay, this is with reference to information technology. Okay, the first is hardware. Okay, we've come a long way from where computers would fill this whole room to something that fits in our pocket or our wallet or our purse that's more powerful than the machines that filled up this entire room. And we're in the Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center for that. Okay, the machines that we have in our pockets now okay, are faster than the machines that used to be here about two, three decades ago. Okay, so that's one. Next is the software, okay, the revolution okay, that we've had. Okay, just think back about how things were about 20 years ago, the type of software okay, that we had access to, okay, and now the type of software that we have okay, that runs on top of the type of hardware okay, that uh, we have. Okay. Chances are that uh, if you have kids at home okay, who have a small computer like this, it's capable of doing a lot of things, but interesting enough, one of the pieces of software that probably is not used that much is actually the software that gives this thing its name, the phone app. Okay, it's not the one that gets used the most. Okay, look at it, it's the texting app, okay, that probably gets used the most, or various other things. Okay, the phone is, if we just were to do a frequency count, that'd probably be the fourth or the fifth, okay, even though that was what this was supposed to be meant for. Okay, so we got the hardware revolution, we got the software revolution. Cell phones came about, what we now know as the smartphones came about because of the combination of those two. And then the third one, 
It's a communication revolution. Okay, I was an undergrad in India, okay, this is in the mid 80s, I used to be sitting thinking, gee whiz, okay, we've seen the PC revolution come by and go. Okay, that's been fantastic, okay, it's changed things considerably. Now, what is going to be that next revolution? And nobody, okay, was able to foresee this big tsunami that we now know as the World Wide Web, okay, that came and hit us, okay, in the late 80s and the early 90s, and life has completely changed. Okay, communication was there, but tying it all together, okay, to the extent to which, okay, the World Wide Web has been able to do, has revolutionized our life completely. Okay, so we got hardware, we got software, and we got communication. The fourth part that we're now in the middle of, and which is enabled by these three, is the data revolution that we're in the middle of. And just like we really had no idea where the hardware revolution was going to take us, okay, you probably read really well-established people in the early computer industry felt that there would be enough if we had just five computers in the world. Okay, people who were involved in the mini uh, computer field okay, felt that who would ever want to have a machine at home, and so on. Okay, so we missed the boat completely on that. Okay, in software also, okay, we've had okay, tremendous challenges. Honestly, on the other way around, thinking that it will be easy to do, it turned out to be really, really hard to do. The communication revolution, okay, the same thing. Okay, think back about uh, so 30 years ago, okay, 25 years ago is when I first came here. I don't know how many here in this room okay, would be familiar with the notion of booking a call. Anybody? No? What? Did I just date myself here? What? Booking a call, a trunk call. Like, if I had to call India after coming here, I'd call the operator and say, okay, here's my phone number, my parents in India, and I hang up, and then the whole set of things would go in motion over there, and then I'd get a call back about an hour later and saying they're on the line, I'd say, hello, they say, hello, and then the line would break, and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> and then that was it, then you start the whole process again. Now, you just pick up your phone, and you got the communication going on there. Okay, so just think about how these three, hardware, software, and communication have revolutionized our lives in ways that we couldn't even imagine. That's what is going to happen with reference to data in ways that we can't imagine yet. And here's a little bit of inkling as to why it's going to be. Okay, data exists like fossils are about the past. Okay, you can think of data as anything that you measure. Okay, if you measure it, that's data. Okay, pristine. Okay, it's there. Okay, like how much rainfall did we just now have? Okay, what was the temperature today? What was the temperature yesterday? And so on. And like fossils, data is about the past. Okay, there's no such thing as future data. Okay, we don't have it yet. Okay, like future fossils. Okay, we don't. Okay, it's what we have in the past. And like fossils, they tell us something about the past, which is good. Okay, we'll see one example of that. But what is more interesting is that the past is often predictive of the future. And that's where data comes into play. And now what we have is we got more and more and more of this data. Okay, that's one of the places where the big comes from. Okay, the big comes from we got more and more and more. The more happening is that every time we go online and do something, somebody is recording what it is that we are doing and a certain pattern of our behavior is being recorded. Based upon that pattern of our behavior, they would like to tell us some things about us. That if you saw this movie, then you may like these movies. If you read these books, then you may like okay, these books, and so on like that. Okay, that is what data is capable of doing for us. Okay, we'll some examples of that in just a bit. Okay, so that is perhaps in a very tight night, uh, nutshell, okay, what this revolution is about. Okay, so you can compare it with the three that went before, and obviously those three are not yet over. They're still ongoing. And we don't know yet okay, where these three are going to go further. Okay, but what we have in addition to this is this fourth one, okay, that is just not joined and is going to change okay, the way in which we live. Okay, so um, <clears throat> what the theme of my uh, presentation is uh, going to be about is, uh, back up, yeah. What we can do in our classrooms, okay, when we're trying to motivate this, okay, for our students here, okay. 
So um, what we are going to do is uh, not that much different than what we would do if you were to run a science competition. Like how many here have sort of supervised teams that have participated in a science fair or something okay, some there? Okay. Now, everybody here is familiar with the scientific method. Okay, you click on that, you can go to images. Okay, there's a whole bunch of these, okay, that come up, okay, that represent the uh, scientific method. And if you look at one of these over here, if you look at the commonality between them, they'll have six steps or seven steps and so on, but there'll be things about, okay, you are making an observation, and based upon that, okay, you ask yourself a question, then you come up with a possible guess as to what would be the answer of that question uh, after you've done some research, and then you test it out, okay, and you gather some data to see if that actually supports, okay, your guess. What you're going to do now in this data jam contest is very similar to this, but with some slight modifications in how these steps are arranged. Okay? And the modifications are in the spirit of the following. Okay. We're talking about the scientific method. Okay, and that's what we are going to be doing here as part of the, the data jam. Okay, so for those of you who've been here in previous sessions here, you know the answer to the following questions there. Okay, so please. Okay, so if I were to ask you, give me a name of a scientist, Maybe what Tesla. might you say? Tesla. Tesla, okay. And let's go further beyond Tesla. Keep going backwards, further in history. Avogadro. Avogadro, okay, let's go further back. He's Archimedes. cool, you got a number named after himself. Yeah. Archimedes. Archimedes, that's too far back. <laughs> well, actually, that's good. That was good. Now we have bounded it is in between over here there. Okay, so Archimedes was, was good. Okay. But the father of what you would consider as the scientific method. Over there. Somebody said Da Vinci. Da Vinci. Okay. There's a lot. Let's move a little bit forward. There. Between. Some more people. Just give me around the era of Da Vinci. There. The person who invented the telescope. So I'm looking at that. Okay, we'll go with Galileo. Uh, okay? There. Why? Because he's the picture person whose picture I have. Okay? <laughs> so we could have done it with a, a bunch of other people here. Okay, but he was the first okay, empirical scientist. Okay? He started climbing tall buildings and dropped balls down and saw okay, how far, okay, how fast they fall. Okay? Set up inclined planes and rolled things down that. Okay? Tied things to end of ropes and swung them around. Okay? Called them simple pendulums and made up. Uh, various measurements about that, and he did things and he observed things, and he tried to see if I can fit some math on top of that. Okay, that's the experimental science. That's what's called as the first paradigm of science. Now, after this, okay, came a group of people who said, well, maybe we can do all of this in just our heads, and we don't have to okay, actually do experiments and so on like that. We do these thought experiments, okay, starting off with Newton, Okay, leading onwards from there, where it wasn't okay, so much experiments that were done, but it was a map okay, that led to things, and then it was able to predict okay, how a certain experimental phenomenon should be, and came to the second uh, phase of, of science, or the second paradigm of science, which was theoretical science, okay, which was based on math. Okay, then came a stage when uh, there were some things that it was just too complicated for us to come up with the math for it. The systems were just too involved. And then two, there are some things that we just couldn't do experiments on. Okay, some of these things are like, for example, thermonuclear explosions. Okay, we can't do that. Okay, and then other things are like earthquakes. Okay, well, we don't know when what's gonna happen. Okay, so what emerged was Another form of science for which okay, this very place was created, okay, the Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center, which is computational science. How do we simulate these things? No. Okay. And now we're in the midst of what's called as the fourth paradigm of science, okay, which is data-driven science. Okay. Now what is interesting here is that 
Galileo did experiments and you gathered data and then based upon that data you did some observations or you did some things that okay you can see if you can make some math okay fit to that now what's interesting about data science is that we don't necessarily do experiments to get the data the data is already there Okay, and that's our past behavior of that data. And then we're saying, okay, what is it, okay, that we can get from that data? Okay, now you could, but that's not how typical data science is. Okay, data science, okay, works with data, okay, that's already there. And what you will be, okay, given access to is a whole bunch of data sets. Okay? And you're going to be given the opportunity to do two things. Okay? And these two have to meet together. Okay, that is, okay, here's the data. The data is going to tell a story, okay? And in the afternoon, okay, we're going to go into more detail about that, okay? What does the data have to say? But then the other part of it, there's a question that we are asking, okay? We got to see how these two can meet together, okay? There's some interesting questions that we can ask, and we got to see if the data can support that. We're just given this data, we're going to say, well, what questions could I ask of this data, okay? So let's just suppose and give you uh, an example of the later part, okay? I've got the GPAs of the grade performance of a whole bunch of students, okay, that are at a particular university, okay? And uh, so I'm interested to know, okay, I see their GPAs, I see the courses that they've taken and so on like that, and I see everything about them, uh, whether they're athletes and so on like that, and I start wondering, are there any questions that I can ask uh, about this here? And then one possible question may be, gee whiz, I wonder if there is a change in performance of student athletes between semesters, particularly, let's say, about football players, okay, college football. The fall season okay, takes up a significant amount of their time. Is there a difference in the GPA of college football players in the fall versus the spring? Personally, I can say that'd be an interesting question there. Okay, now do we have the data for it? Yeah, sure. I've got all of the data that's there. Okay, so now look at what do I do about that? Okay. Okay, let's study it, and we can do, we don't have to do something very, very profound, okay? It's a very, very simple thing, and it's just getting to know the data that we elaborated upon further in the afternoon, just some simple, like, averages, standard deviations, and so on like that, and seeing it. And what would you guess be? There actually is a difference between college football players' performance in the fall and the spring. Any guesses? I think they do better during the season. Who said? I did. I, I said I think they do better during the season. During the season. And we'll pause on that. And you? I agree. You agree. Okay? Why? It seems counterintuitive, right? That they got, on top of their academic work, they got all this other work that's coming in over there. Go ahead. Eligibility. Huh? Eligibility to play. Oh, eligibility to play. Interesting. Okay, go. That's what I was thinking. So they want to maintain their eligibility to play. They're going there. Go ahead. I was just going to say, during the season, they have all of the support that they need to get everything done. Everything's organized for them. They just go from place to place. Go from place job. to place. Okay. Why does it matter? The data tells us the answer. <laughs> uh, no, the data tells. Uh, okay, that's an excellent question. There, the data tells us there is a difference. But if we know what is the reason, then maybe we can do something about it. Then you have to do an experiment to define that. Otherwise, you can't do cause and effect, right? Exactly right. Okay, but at least we know that these two go together. So, but unless we know that there is a difference, suppose there wasn't, then it's a moot question. We're just all guessing. We're okay. Oh uh, no, no, no. There is. This study was done. Yes, this was. Okay, so we're not guessing right at this point here. Okay. The, um, where I used to be before uh, Indiana University, the president of the university, Miles Brand, later on became the president of NCAA. And he was very big in student academic uh, performance and balancing of athletics and academics. And this was one of the work okay, that he did. And it's not that hard of a thing to do. It turns out that, yes, the performance in the fall is actually better than that in the spring. And it also turns out to be for the reason that you said is that the support structure is there during the fall. People are holding their athletes' feet to the fire and okay, making sure that they do well. But in the spring, poof, okay, that drops. And now 
that's another thing that we will look at is that it now gives administrators possibly a motivation for thinking about what should we do during the spring. Okay, maybe we should okay, continue to keep that in place, or maybe we should bring in the support for other groups of people and so on. So that's a, another component of this data jam. Uh, the presentations that I think would really go the whole distance are saying, here's the data, and here's what the data is telling me. The data is telling me that there is a difference in performance in college football, in our, yes, college football players between fall and spring. That's what the data says, and I see that. But now, I need to go one step further as to why that could be the case. We form a hypothesis about that okay, and see okay, what is the case, and then that leads to possible recommendations okay, as to what we can do with that. Okay? So that's sort of the whole uh, streamline in which we could uh, go through this. Okay? We analyze the data, we try to come up with some observation about the data, and then from that, hopefully, okay, we can make some suggestion about what happens, uh, what we can do, and what we can act upon. Okay? So the question that you said is very valid, because it's very polite and kind terms, I try to tell my students, so on. Okay, like you've done this there, okay, and you've got to motivate me. Okay, it's nice, it's beautiful, you got a nice graph and everything there. So what? Okay, what are you going to then take from that? And that's one of the things I'd encourage okay, your students okay, to drive home on right from day one as to why would I want to do this. Okay? So we're going to do uh, a, an exercise in, in two ways. Okay? Remember, the questions and the data, and they got to go together. Okay, so you don't want to like this. Okay, they gotta go and meet and then it's gonna be like driving on a narrow country road where two cars are coming in ancient India, okay? <laughs> and hopefully you don't collide into each other, you manage to okay, go that way. Okay, so here's the thing, okay, talking about cars colliding. Here's a, uh, we're gonna work through an exercise and then I want you in groups of like three or four people to do something similar to what we are just now doing. Okay, so a concern that I have is um, fatal traffic accidents, okay? I want to reduce that, yeah, obviously, right? So this is a thought experiment that I'd encourage you to try it out in your classrooms, okay? Just ask them to come up with any social problem or issue that they have. And then in order to answer this, come up with a solution to this problem, what data would you need? What data would you like gather? Now this is a pure, ideal thought process. Because the data may not exist out there, but that's perfectly fine. Okay, so if you could, okay, if you had this data, I'd be able to answer this question. Okay, that's wishful thinking. Now if you're in a position where we say, Jesus, no matter what data I get, I'm not going to be able to answer that question. That's a really tough question that, okay, that we got there. Okay, so what would be the ideal data okay, that would help you answer that? And how would you analyze it? And then what would the policy of that be? Okay, so here's some data that I would gather, okay, like where have accidents happened, okay, how many people have been involved in it, what was the time of the day, what was the weather, okay, what type of vehicle was it, okay, driver details, their age, their blood alcohol content, what was the, the speed, the seat belts, and so on like that. This are all stuff that I would like to get. Okay, now once I have that, can I discern certain patterns? Okay, do I notice that it's beyond a certain speed limit that there are more accidents that happen compared to others? Okay, is there a certain type of vehicles that seem to be more prone to accidents than others? Okay, or is a combination of the age of the driver and the vehicle? Okay, what is it? Okay, just looking at the various things that okay could possibly lead to that. Okay, now in all of these. Remember that, as you're also bringing out, what we first establish is, is a correlation. Okay, now whether there is a causation link between that, that, okay, that goes, okay, the next step there. Okay, then we come back with, say, some policy about how do we do it, how do we address that based upon this, like, do we increase, like, the penalties and so on, like, for example, penalties in construction zones, are much higher, in school zones, are much higher, and so on. Or are there ways in which okay we can uh, educate okay, people uh, about uh, this? Has anyone ever gone to traffic school? No? One? Oh yes. Yeah, I've been to traffic <laughs> court. Okay. I've been to both. Oh, you've been to both. Okay, I've been to traffic court. Okay. And uh, 
A friend of mine has been to traffic school, and when I say a friend of mine, genuinely is a friend of mine. Okay, it's not me. Okay. It really is a friend of mine there. Okay, who was caught okay speeding, and he just thought, okay, let me just explore the process there. And so he went to traffic school. And he said he was just shown these videos of all these gory accidents and so on that can happen. So hopefully that changes the behavior of a person. For me, I was curious about the other side of things. I wanted to go to the court. And I went to uh, the court, which till this day surprises me. Why did that prime real estate spot there in Pittsburgh get to be the county jail? Okay. I still don't get it. Okay, to where it is a beautiful place for a high-rise apartment there, but that's where the jail is there. Okay. Anyway, no, I did not go to jail. Okay. I just went to court there, and I was curious to find out what it is. And that was about the education process. Now, let me uh, tie this into a real case. That before we go off to an exercise okay, that I'd like you uh, to do is um, getting insurance. Okay? There are different segments of the population, okay? and they have different <coughs> risk factors. Okay? One segment okay, that has a fairly high risk factor are motorcycle riders. You ride a motorcycle, sir? Or? Yes, I do. Oh, you do? Okay. So maybe what I say will tie into uh, what you have experienced there. So very few companies were willing to lower premiums for motorcycle riders. And then along came one company and said, hey, let's dissect this a little bit more. And it turned out to be that if you're within a certain age group, like you're above like 30 or so, and you have a family, okay, and a few other, and you have like a paying job and things like that, it turned out to be that the risk plummets, goes down, okay? And Progressive made a killing, okay, by capturing that particular market and saying that we're going to insure, okay, that group of people. So we're not going to just wipe them all off with just saying that the motorcycle riders and hence you don't get it. That's what the data did for them. The data showed that if you have these characteristics and the people who had those were not involved in so many accidents. Okay, that then gave them the leverage to do that. And a bunch of other things. So for example, if you've been to Las Vegas, okay, there's a uh, large uh, casino company, Haraz. Okay. Many of you may be familiar with that name there. And uh, you're raising your hand for everything, man. You get around. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. You get around. Okay, good for you. Okay. I'm the senior person. Yes, yes. <laughs> You're there. <laughs> I want to be you when I get there. Okay, so there. Yeah, so been everywhere. Okay, so Haran is thinking, okay, gee, with once again customer segmentation, okay, which group of people do we target you know, so that we can get them into our casinos? Okay, and obviously, want to have the people who will leave most of their money behind in the casinos. Now, so it turns out it's not the high rollers. It so turned out it's the proverbial common man. Okay, it's there. okay, on their way back or forth from work, I guess, they stop off a little bit, spend about an hour or so in the casino, and uh, leave their money behind, and then they go home there. So what they did was, okay, let, let, we don't need to target okay, giving uh, people uh, like free rooms or so on like that. Okay, what we need to give is like a coupon for a family of four to have dinner in a local restaurant or so. And that was how they did their marketing because that was the segment that was giving them more revenue rather than the high rollers there. If it was a high roller, you may be thinking about giving them free rooms and so on, but that turned out not to be the case. The only way you'd be able to find that out is by listening to the data. Okay? So here's an exercise okay, that I have for you here. Okay, if you can form groups of say three or four people, think of any other societal problem that you would like to address? Anything? Okay, what data would you need to collect? This is the ideal situation that hopefully is already there. What would you do with that data? And what policy do you see yourself? Okay, let's uh, do a survey of the room. Let's start from the back. And uh, the teams there, uh, you could say, what is your societal problem and uh, what data you would gather, the analysis and the policy or so. So, go ahead. Uh, there. Yeah, I'll speak up a bit. Yeah. We talked about how to move people into the job market. We talked about barriers to employment. 
job training, education level, drug and alcohol involvement, transportation, job availability, child care, multi-generational poverty, and most tellingly, comparing current data to historical data under problems, under programs that would exist at various points. For the analysis, we looked, wanted to look for correlations between, kind of went from real broad to a straight narrow. Correlations between drug and alcohol legal involvement and access to employment. And then for policy considerations, rehab clinics, drug testing for welfare, time limits, and multi-generational issues. There were two sides to this debate. Moving forward. Uh, yeah. uh, we, 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 we were going to try to look at school bullying. <laughs> school bullying. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what what data? No, that's cool. What data we, we'd be able to gather for we, that? We were thinking perhaps we would call some of these hotlines and try to collect some data from them because it would be objective, as opposed to necessarily because all the kids at school aren't going to talk and tell. But we thought maybe some of these agencies might have some data to help us regionally to understand the dimensions and then you know see where we can take it from there, analyze it, and then hopefully come up with something to go back to the administrators with some at least information on how we might approach it. Right. We only got that far. An education or so. You were about to say something? Well, obviously, we, you know, obviously the school record would have some, but we were also talking how you might even be able to like use some of the social media services yeah. if you had the KPI. Right. Right. To, to see if you could get yeah, it. I'd be curious in like cyberbullying versus like right. physical bullying. Is there like a gender yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. difference yeah. between we that or okay, that you see and, and so on? Like right now, I have no idea uh, yeah. there, but I assume that the data real. is out there. Like, yeah, yeah, to be able to access it there. So, um, folks, yeah. We looked at um, heroin users and deaths in Pennsylvania, right. and. Uh, Anybody else want to share, or uh, or do you folks like to go? Or it's really silly. Some yeah. really can be compared. Right. So we're not solving the the, um, the world's issues, <laughs> yeah. but we were talking about the fact that there's um, that U.S. is a very disposable society, and so we're thinking about um, addressing uh, our our tendency towards waste and um, energy spent around the holidays. Um, we thought about um, looking the data uh, about volume of wrapping paper sales um, and maybe looking at uh, demographics um, in terms of maybe even socioeconomic demographics in terms of wrapping paper sales between states, education level C, um, if there's any uh, correlation with um, uh, education level about recycling programs and maybe the policy would be somewhere around um, recycling programs or repurposing uh, household waste. We just destroyed okay. Christmas wrapping. <laughs> 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 do it. Well, this is an exercise that you can try uh, with your students in uh, seeing okay, what social causes that they may be interested in. And this is working towards an ideal uh, situation. Okay. And it's sometimes only after we start collecting the data and we look at it, then we'll get some new revelations. Like something that I was involved in recently is energy conservation at CMU. And uh, when you measure how much each building is consuming, uh, one would imagine that during Christmas break or so that the energy consumption should plummet quite a bit. And there are no students on campus and so on. Well, so it turns out there's, there's only a small drop of about 30% or so which tells us that it's not the students that's consuming it, it's the building itself. 
okay, that is consuming so much energy here just to keep the building uh, going. So uh, that then gives us, okay, it's not necessarily student behavior, and we do want to focus on that, but it's more on architectural issues okay, that we probably need to focus on in order to address the uh, energy issues there. Okay. This is a tool that Google has made available called BigQuery that uh, allows us to analyze data uh, using a uh, language called SQL, okay, which is a language that you use to talk to databases. Um, I just want to pull up sample tables here. Okay, This is a well-known data set called the Natality data set. And let me pull up this data set. This is, would mirror part of the activity that your teams would do. Okay, so you find this data set and here's a description of the various fields of it. Okay, what's the year? <clears throat> what's the month, the day? Okay, and this is about uh, the birth of children. Okay, what was the child's race? What was the weight in pounds? Okay, the APGAR score, okay, which is a, something from zero to 10. Okay, it's an indication of within a minute or five minutes how healthy is the child. Uh, the mother's resident state, the mother's race, the age, the gestation period, whether the mother was married or not, and cigarettes use, alcohol use, and so on. Okay. The father's age, so on. You have all of this data. It's there. And this would be typical of what your students may have, is that is, there are tons of data sets like this. <laughs> What I would suggest is perhaps lay out 10, 15 of these data sets and say, okay, just go at it. Okay, what questions do you think we can ask them? Don't worry about whether we're going to be able to solve them or not, but just see what would you find interesting about this, okay, that you may be able to ask. Okay, whether we're able to answer it or not, we'll come to it later. Okay, but this thing, we're going from data to the questions. Okay, now we've got to bridge that gap in between. Okay, but the exercise that, uh, I'd have my uh, students do on this is um, is there a relationship between the amount of alcohol that a mother takes and the birth weight of the baby? Is there some link between that or so? Okay, can you? And this is a relatively straightforward a statistical task. Okay, between how many? Okay. Uh, um, units of alcohol okay, a mother takes versus their uh, birth weight. And uh, here's, uh, let me see if I can show you a sample solution. Okay. So, is there a difference in birth weights of babies born to mothers who drink alcohol versus those who do not? Uh, those who are heavy drinkers versus those who do not drink. Okay, and here's one way in which you can slice it. Okay. Uh, did the mother drink alcohol, did not drink at all? Okay, and what is the statistical, okay, the average weight between them? From this, okay, you can see, okay, a possible link between uh, not drinking and drinking. And whether that difference is statistically significant or not, that's another issue. But the fact that we're able to pull that from here is interesting here. Uh, here's uh, something is, uh, I don't know, did you catch that last line? Okay, uh, I, I don't want to just swing past that last line. I'll come to back to that in a minute. Because one of the reasons that I love this report is uh, here's, Okay, the average birth weight. Now, this is what the data is saying. Okay, this is the, uh, the birth weight versus uh, how many, um, how much alcohol okay, that the mother took. Okay, now this is interesting, right? You don't take anything; the weight is high. Okay, then you take some; the weight comes down. 
But then afterwards, okay, as this student very interestingly commented, is moderate to heavy drinkers had lighter babies than those who did not drink, but the more they drank, the heavier the baby got. Okay, now that looks uh, interesting here. That, uh, but if that's what the data is saying, what do you think are the possible reasons for that? Okay, now this would be, I think, quite an interesting observation to make out of this, that we've now got not what we would expect, but a little bit of an anomalous behavior here. Okay, now we're on the realm of conjectures, because the data is not going to be able to answer this question for us there. Okay, but what would your conjecture be? Okay, this is I'm kind of joking, but I'm thinking, like, you could drink when you're pregnant as long as it's a lot. <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. Like, I don't want to right, yeah. Well, well, I shouldn't go beyond that. I'm on tape here, so. <laughs> yeah. so Diabetes. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Diabetes. Diabetes me constituting what? So if you have diabetes, your babies are going to be bigger. You tend to have bigger babies if you have diabetes. If the mother is diabetic, yes. Yes. The, uh, the baby tends to be bigger? OK. And uh, the link with alcohol? Just be, yeah, gestational diabetes. Oh, OK. OK. Other thoughts? Um, we don't know how many uh, babies we're talking about in these categories. And so there might only be a couple of women who drink an insane amount of alcohol. Very so interesting observation. Them. Yes. OK. Well, like how, how big is each of these sets? Now, you do have access to that information, so we can investigate that. Okay. Yeah, I'll get at the back of the yeah. Maybe the weight is a fat, and maybe it's not a healthy birth weight. Maybe there's, uh, maybe there's different kinds of heavy, and that there, maybe there's unhealthiness in that weight. What kind of weight is it? OK. What kinds of weight? What were you going to say? That was sort of I was going to get at the, what, what is the average healthy? What is a good? What is a good one? Okay, so that, that raises that, that question over here. Yes, go ahead. But the other issue is when we look at babies, the child's birth weight, we have to keep it in relationship to the length of the baby. Um, okay, I, I think you're leading towards what I was also thinking is that this doesn't factor into the weight of the parents. Right. Okay, these are petite women versus larger women. Okay, or same thing for par for fathers. Okay, that would have a correlation one would expect to the birth weight of the baby. That doesn't get factored in over here. So I'm there just thinking to myself that stronger people are probably able to take okay more alcohol, uh, but independent of that alcohol, they're going to produce babies that are heavier anyway. There. So. But the size of the parents is already reflected in the average of the baby. You stand that by itself. Yeah. So that's really not a confounding thing because that's already just that part of it comes into the average weight of a child because you've got all the parents out there in different weights. And right. Right. And so sizes. where I think it may, and this is just pure conjecture, is that the people who are at this side are people who, as parents, are heavier. But they're and already that you're looking for alcohol here because that's what you isolated. Yeah. That that factor you said is already in that blue bar graph. Right. The parents. No, uh, it's, it's not in over here. It's the way the parents are in all of them. But I'm, I'm conjecturing that this is skewed. Like what you see here in this group are more heavyweight parents than what you see over here. Okay? And if that were the case, then automatically one would imagine that it would lead to heavier weight uh, babies yes, there. But at this point, okay, I want to, and I'll come to you in just a moment, okay, the takeaway like you have from this is that this was just very simple data, okay, and analysis was done, and a fairly abnormal result came out of that. Okay, this is something that we didn't necessarily expect. And if you can come across a data set that has similarities like this, you do an analysis and you're expecting something, you get something different, okay, and then you come up with some conjectures for that, and then it leads to the thing that, okay, what could you do to confirm those conjectures? Okay, what other data might you be able to get? And then is there something that okay, you want to make a policy about this we're recommending? And the question came up earlier as to what, what is a healthy weight of the baby, okay? And is weight alone the measure that we should be concerned about, and so on. Okay, so there are numerous other things. Okay, that come into play here. Okay, uh, somebody had their hand up at the back. Well, the data I didn't see, and probably the biggest correlation between birth weight um, is the gestational age of the baby. So how long was the mother pregnant 
The reason that the blue bar might be smaller is because we're seeing a lot of freebies in there. I don't know. Um, but without that factor, I don't think that, that you can really analyze anything else. Good, good. Okay, all of that okay, factors in here. Okay, the size, okay, said actually that turns out to be a factor. The, these groups are not equally represented okay, in this. Okay, there are other things okay, that can contribute okay, towards okay, this uh, difference okay, that we see here. Okay? But I just want to use this as a simple example. Okay? Uh, another colleague of mine, okay, Randy Weiberg and I, we've been co-teaching this, and this is one introductory example okay, that we use to just expose people to how the data could possibly okay, speak to you. And what is it saying? Okay? And are we listening it to it correctly or not? These are all questions okay, that are important. Okay? So I wouldn't say that this is in any way or means a conclusive okay, observation here, but just one observation that comes out of the data. Further comments here? Okay, I think I'm a little bit over my uh, time slot here. Okay, but the main takeaways that I want you to have is that one is the importance of this. Okay, we are in the midst of this data revolution. And just like how things before have changed our lives, okay, so are things going to be changed by the data revolution. Next is it's this hooking up of questions and the data. Okay, so being able to come up with just free-flowing questions, okay? just brainstorming with as many questions as we can about it, independent of whether I'll be able to find data to be able to support that. Because I would say in a situation like this, what would motivate myself and possibly okay, students would be it be an interesting question. Okay, it'd be something so the interestingness of the question is probably even more important, okay, than uh, okay, do I have data okay that can completely support this. Okay, so it's a very interesting question to ask. So that would be okay, a thing that you may want to, however way it is, okay, write up like 10 questions on the board and have it voted upon as to which ones okay, would the teams okay, like to work on there. Okay. And then uh, is another exercise in the classes is just given various data sets, um, what type of questions okay, could you possibly ask about this here? Okay. I'm personally left-handed. Okay, and uh, um, I don't know how many here are left-handed. There's a few people here. So, uh, is there a correlation between left-handedness and anything else? Nope. Okay. That sounds <laughs> <out> to me. <laughs> yeah. For a long time, okay, there was this myth, okay, that people who are left-handed are more accident-prone, okay, as opposed to this. And uh, it, it would be quite interesting as to how the folklore of that started. Smart. Yep. My husband has me convinced they're smarter, creative, intelligent. <laughs> Performing. And my wife keeps reminding me there are exceptions to that. <laughs> so there, but uh, yeah. But anyway, yeah. So whenever I like see some type of behavior or so, I mentally like to see okay, is there something connected to left hand? And because that has a personal okay, meaning uh, to me here. Yeah. You know, I think historically left-handed people were considered. Yeah, 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 that, that's right. And until, what was the name for it? Um, the name slips uh, me, yeah. Uh, they were different, okay, and whenever they are different, uh, there. But we're now we're, we're getting off uh, uh, topic here. Okay? But uh, what I was leaning towards is that this, if the, your teams can identify something that they relate to, okay, that they find, okay, personally having some meaning for them, okay, it'll give them more of the drive. For this, okay. So personally, I, I would say that this is a fascinating area, and to echo, okay, what someone said earlier, okay, we're delighted, okay, that all of you here. And I'm personally delighted that okay, this content is moving to the uh, high schools uh, there. So it's, uh, it's it's fantastic that way. And if there's any which way that I can help with it in your school program or so, okay, I'm always uh, um, quite willing okay, to be of any assistance. I do a lot of outreach. And you can reach me very easily with this Raja, R-A-J-A, at uh, cmu.edu.